So now in this next video and flowchart, we're going to begin looking at how muscles contract. And that is going to be summarized by the sliding filament model. And that's what we'll be focusing on and entitling this next flowchart. The sliding filament model, and this will be part one. So what happens during this process? What does it result in? The sliding filament model is something used to explain how muscles contract. We looked at the overall results of muscle contraction, specifically at the sarcomere level in the previous video. The Z-line, that distance gets shorter, the length of the filaments does not change, only the amount of overlap between actin and myosin changes. Make sure that's very clear before you even start to look at the sliding filament model so that when you see that at the end of this contraction process, you're familiar with why that is so based off of the steps that we'll cover. So to begin, in order to understand how a muscle contracts, you actually have to understand the opposite, how a muscle is prior to contraction in its relaxed state. So we'll state over here on the following. When we look at a muscle fiber, a muscle fiber, which is just a muscle cell, and um, if it's at rest, we notice it in the following arrangement. We're going to see and notice the following with its structure and overall being at this state. We're going to see that tropomyosin, which is a regulatory protein, remember, that's on the actin filament, tropomyosin, that's from part of the thin actin, will cover and is covering what is known as the myosin binding site. And this is, of course, on the actin filament. The actin filament contains a myosin binding site and tropomyosin and troponin, both of which are regulatory proteins. So the tropomyosin covers the myosin binding site all along the thin actin filament. So this actin filament that is within the sarcomere will have a bunch of tropomyosin covering the myosin binding site um, and this is going to be across the entire thin actin filament at rest. Key word here, key stipulation is that this is the muscle cell at rest. So what you can uh, simply imagine is that you have this structure, let's imagine as the actin protein. Um, you have another actin molecule here, another one here. And the actin protein has a site on it called the myosin binding site, MBS. So does this one, you know, this has an MBS. So does this one, this one has an MBS. You get the idea. Both of all of these are units of the actin filament and imagine there's a million of these, okay, left and right, stretching the entire sarcomere. What's going to be covering the myosin binding site? Tropomyosin. So there's going to be this molecule that comes on and stays on the actin, uh, the myosin binding site, I should state, and that's covering it. Why is it covering it? Well, this is because in the relaxed state, a muscle cell has this structure right here called tropomyosin, this interfering regulatory protein is regulating contraction by stating that the myosin binding site shall be covered. And the myosin binding site on the actin filament, the actin, uh, this is AP for actin protein here, this filament is going to be covered all with tropomyosin at the myosin binding site. So make sure that's very clear in your head. This is at rest. So let's disrupt that. Let's change that. Let's look at what happens during contraction. So let's look at the steps involved with contraction. And these steps are highlighted on figure 50.29. So take a look at this as we go through these steps. Now, the key idea with this flowchart, just to sort of say before we actually get into the steps, is the following. We're going to look at how a muscle contraction is initiated. Because remember, muscles are intimately related to a nervous system connection. Remember, there needs to be a motor output. How does that happen? This is what this flowchart is basically going to highlight. So let's look at the steps. The steps are as follows. First, what you need is a muscle fiber, right? This is our basic, you know, thing that will move, that will contract. It's a muscle cell with sarcomeres within it. That muscle fiber gets a message, and that message is coming from a motor neuron, okay? It gets a message from a motor neuron because skeletal muscle as we'll see is voluntary so you will have some sort of message that's sent to the muscle that needs to move and that will be received by the muscle fiber this is transmitted as an action potential so this message is transmitted this is how the nervous system speaks this is how it talks to the rest of the body via action potentials 
So the transmitted uh, message is equal to an action potential. And this is, uh, I should say that this is actin. I think AP is confusing here. Let's call that actin. Don't call it AP. So this is an action potential. And that's going to come to the muscle fiber via a motor neuron in the form of a message called an action potential. Okay, nothing new here. This is what we've known and seen before in the nervous system. But now let's break down how this is interpreted and understood and passed down during this process. So what we need to first understand is where this is occurring. This is all occurring at what is known as the motor unit. So let's write this down. This all happens at a motor unit. So what is a motor unit? We'll define a motor unit as the following. This is when we have one motor neuron, just one neuron, one motor neuron connected to, connected to many, connected to many muscle fibers. So one motor neuron connected to many muscle fibers um, at what is known as the neuro muscular neuro muscular junction this is more commonly just abbreviated as the nmj the neuro muscular junction this is shown in figure 50.31 if you want to see the actual neuro muscular junction so we have a motor unit which is just one motor neuron connected to many muscle fibers Anytime a motor neuron is connected to a muscle fiber, the connection is called a neural for the neuron, muscular for the muscle, junction, the space between the neuron and the muscle. Okay, so that's where we're at. What's going to happen here? We'll state that at this neuromuscular junction, NMJ, the neuron has a message as an action potential. But a muscle can't understand an action potential. It can understand the language of neurotransmitters. And we know that neurotransmitters can be used to talk to other things within the nervous system and the body as a whole. So the neuron knows this. And the neuron, as a result of the action potential, says, you know what, I'm going to take this action potential and convert it to a chemical message called acetylcholine. So the neuron secretes acetylcholine, which is just usually abbreviated as ACH, capital A-C-H. Um, and this is a neurotransmitter, a chemical message to the synaptic cleft, which we should be very familiar with. That's just the space in between point A and point B, of which the neurotransmitter is going to flow through. So point A is the neuron, the motor neuron, and point B is the muscle fiber. So the neurotransmitter is going to be released from the motor neuron through the synaptic cleft and finally reach the specific receptor, acetylcholine receptor, on the muscle fiber. So that's what we'll state happens next. Acetylcholine, as a neurotransmitter, has to bind. It has to have a lock and key with something. And that is going to be to the muscle fiber receptors that are specific to it. So remember, receptors are very specific to what can bind and what cannot bind. Acetylcholine fits that stipulation. Once you have this binding, this directly causes depolarization. Remember what depolarization is. Depolarization, does that mean inhibition or excitation? Depolarization in the world of nervous system means excitation. Excitation will be a critical part of doing contraction. So this binding of acetylcholine to a muscle fiber receptor causes excitation in the form of depolarization across the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber. So the muscle fiber is basically feeling this message throughout its entire um, surrounding structure, throughout its plasma membrane. But there's a bit of a problem here that I want to address on the side. There's a small problem we face as a muscle cell, and it's something to do with the structure. A muscle cell is very big. It's a very large cell. It's multinucleated. It's long. It's cylindrical. So what has to happen is that you need, it seems as if you need a very large, a very strong depolarization in order to spread throughout this very large and long muscle cell. You need a very large depolarization because muscle fibers are inherently based off of their structure and elongated um, appearance and overall uh, makeup. Muscle fibers are very large, simply put. So that's a problem. How can you send this neural message throughout this entire muscle cell and actually within the muscle cell, which is a goal that we'll see, 
we have to get this message into the muscle cell, but it's so big that we need such a large depolarization to occur. So what needs to happen is that overall, we need to somehow, as a problem right now, we need to transmit whatever neural message, and the neural message is in the form of an action potential, into, inside of the muscle fiber. We need to not only just go on the outside of the muscle fiber, but we need the action potential to go into the muscle fiber, not just the outside. So it's no good that this acetylcholine causing depolarization is only across the plasma membrane. We have to go into the muscle cell. We have to go inside and reach the sarcomere area, actually. How can we possibly do that in this very large cell? There's a specific structure that we talked about, and the specific solution is the following. The solution to this conquerable problem, solvable problem, is to use T-tubules. Remember what we said T-tubules were? Infoldings of the plasma membrane. They allow messages, things, depolarization, action potentials, whatever you want to call them, to go into because they are infoldings of the plasma membrane. They allow, T-tubules that is, allow the action potential to travel down the tubules. T-tubules are just pathways. They're tubes. T-tubules down the tubules into, that was our goal, that was our problem, we are solving it, into the unit that does the movement, the myofibrils. The myofibrils within them has what? Myofibrils have the sarcomere. So now we're getting there, we're getting to the sarcomere. T-tubules allow action potential to travel down tubules into the myofibrils, and that is all within the muscle fiber. So that is a solution to the problem. Before, we could only go on the outside. Now we are inside the muscle fiber because the T-tubules are in foldings that allow us to reach the inside. What does this eventually cause? This causes the action potential to move into the cell, into the muscle fiber, into the myofibril. That action potential therefore causes what is known as a wave of depolarization. Lots of depolarization propagates into the cell from wave of depolarization that started at the plasma membrane, went to the T-tubules, and now is able to go and enter the next step, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's the place where we needed the action potential to get to within the muscle cell, within the muscle fiber. That's the myofibril, in other words, that contains the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Why here? Why do we need to get to the SR? Well, that's because once an action potential reaches the SR after getting through the plasma membrane T-tubules, that's going to tell the sarcoplasmic reticulum to do something. And it does the following. The SR releases stored calcium, Ca2+, calcium ions, into the cytosol. Now, more on why we do that a little bit later. Just know that this is the result of a propagating and entering action potential into a muscle cell. Sarcoplasmic reticulum from all the way at this motor neuron has finally gotten a message in the form of an action potential to tell it to release its calcium ions into the cytosol. This basically means that it is now time for contraction. And so there was a lot of steps here. Be able to recount these steps and understand where we are and where we're going. Um, and we'll look at this now next sort of process of contraction. Please notice that all of this is prior to contraction, to prepare for contraction, to get the message from the brain to the muscle in this form. And these are the steps necessary and the problem and solution to overcome and begin the contraction process.